Hi, y'all. In this video, I'm going to talk a little bit about corruption in the legal system. Uh, there is a case pending in the Supreme Court right now called Williams against Pennsylvania, and this is a case that has, like, everything in it that you'd want for some kind of novel. It's got sex, it's got uh, child abuse, child sexual abuse, it's got murder, and it's got government corruption. I mean, it's all there. If you want to write a novel, this is a good template, I suppose. And why it is, I'm going to talk a little bit about why it is that you want to fight against uh, usurpations of a person's liberty. It's really hard to want to argue in favor of a, a two-time convicted murderer. And more than, more than his being a two-time convicted murderer, he is actually a two-time murderer. He has murdered two people. And uh, I, I mentioned this in other videos. These are the cases where you have to really go to, the, go to the mat and fight for it. Because these are the cases where the usurpations on your liberty are born. This is where, where the, the seed of, of uh, liberty's dying is planted. Who wants to argue in favor of a murderer's rights? I mean, he's a murderer! But the, the point of it is, the long and the short of it is, is that a corruptly procured outcome that is good and would be just if properly gotten is still a bad outcome. Go back and do it right. If this person really is the big shit that you say he is, you shouldn't need to lie. You shouldn't need to deceive the court. You shouldn't need to be corrupt in procuring his conviction. The facts should speak for themselves. And if the facts are inadequate to speak for themselves, to, to prove this person's guilt, you shouldn't have brought the prosecution in the first place. You should have done a little bit more investigation. So it's always in these cases. It's always in the child rape, in the rape, in the murder, in the assault, in the rock. It's always in these cases where the new rules, uh, the state will be arguing for new rules of interpretation or court proceedings or whatever, that serve, that, that work in misjustice, that work in injury, uh, work mischief to your rights. Even though, on the face of it, it's only being used on a murderer right now. But the point about a legal principle is, it's generally applicable. Once you have a, a rule of law, it applies to all cases that are similar. And if you can do it to the murderer, who's actually guilty, then there's no reason you can't do it to the accused murderer, who's actually innocent. In any event, so, uh, the background of this case is the guy has com committed two murders. Um, he did one murder, and then some time went by. He did an another murder, and then he's brought to trial for the first murder. He's convicted. He's, he's brought to trial for the second murder, and he's convicted. Now, in the first murder, the, uh, the jury in Pennsylvania did not convict him on the highest count, and they did not sentence him to the fullest uh, punishment that they could give him under the law. And the reason for it is that the guy that he murdered, that he killed, had molested him. And there was actually evidence of this. This wasn't just a clever defense of, oh, I'm saying he molested me, and the jury's like, well, okay, if you say it, it must be true. I mean, it, you could prove, uh, at least to the preponderance of the evidence standard, that this guy was, in fact, a sexual predator who had, in fact, molested this particular guy when he was younger, and he decided to seek some revenge later on. Not saying he should do it. You should bring it to court, prove it in court, and send the, the child molester to prison. Uh, so I don't condone the killing, but I can't say that I don't understand it. I mean, I understand the rage that you would have. But more importantly than what I do or don't understand, the jury that sat in judgment of this, this particular man on all the facts looked at it and said, we don't condone it, but we can understand that this is a mitigating factor. You're not the worst of the worst. You did do a murder. We're not going to say it's the worst kind of murder. And we're not going to say that you're the most culpable kind of person who, who should suffer the fullest penalties of the law. Nevertheless, we're not going to condone your seeking private revenge for private wrongs that were done to you. You could have gone to the police, you could have done this, you could have done the other thing. So you get whatever it is that they gave him. Some time goes by, the second trial comes up. And along this time frame, a new district, a district attorney is elected into office. And uh, he's really pro-death penalty. I'm not saying that's right or wrong. I'm not giving my opinion here on the death penalty. Uh, but whatever your view on the death penalty is, the one thing I think that we should all be able to agree on is that it should be reserved for the people who are actually worthy of it. It shouldn't be given out all willy-nilly in any event. So uh, a memo comes up to him on the facts of the case. He reads the memo and uh, approves seeking the death penalty in this particular case. Now the prosecutor who was involved in the second prosecution um, managed to get this guy's co-conspirator to flip and, and uh, testify in, in court under oath. That the, the reason that they, oh, by the way, this second killing was really brutal. I mean, it, it was, uh, this man was tortured to death. He was beaten to death with a lug wrench and uh, set on fire and left to die. So, just, I mean, it, it is, no way, no two ways about it. It is an absolutely horrible way to die. Uh, I would not want to go that way. But in any event, um, the, second, the prosecutor in the second case uh, 
get flips the guy's uh, accomplice in, in this murder who says that the reason for the the killing was robbery they wanted the guy's money and that uh, he had received no other than he wouldn't get first degree he'd get only uh, second degree or something like that it, but the death penalty wasn't on the table is essentially the offer that he got from the state and that was the only offer uh, the prosecutor said this the uh, accomplice testified under oath to this. The guy, uh, Williams here, uh, his attorney for his capital trial met with him the night before the trial for about an hour, and that was the only conversation that his defense counsel ever had with him, and the defense counsel went in and did a dreadful job, just absolutely terrible lawyer. Uh, so you had a terrible defense counsel and a corrupt prosecutor. Why do I say the prosecutor is corrupt? Well, apparently, uh, there was a little bit more to the deal uh, with the accomplice than was let on, namely in that they told the accomplice that if he didn't do this, they would prosecute him for an unrelated murder and seek the death penalty, and that they would promise him that he would uh, be eligible for parole and he would do no more than, I can't remember what the years are now, and then he would be out on, on parole. Uh, this was lied about by the, by the accomplice and lied about by the uh, prosecutor's office. Not I'm not indicting the the newly elected district district attorney. He wasn't making these actual trial decisions. This was one of his employees. So don't, I mean, it's not his fault. Uh, he's in the case only because he signed off on it and then he comes up later on because he was, he ever saw the office on, on appeals that went up and argued that nevertheless this guy should remain uh, convicted and sentenced to death. Well, there were some other facts and I've done a little bit of looking into this on my own. There were some other facts that are rather interesting, um, namely in that uh, the prosecutor had evidence that this case was like the last case, namely in that the guy that was murdered in this case, so uh, he too was a child predator who had in fact molested this particular man when he was younger, and that this murder uh, had the same genesis as the first murder. This is, guy, and this is a guy who was sexually molested by a group of pedophiles, and he was hunting them down one by one and killing them. Again, I don't condone private justice like that, but I, I understand. I understand why you'd want to do that. And if I were sitting on a jury and I were persuaded of this, I would not sentence that man to death either. I may not even sentence him to any hard time. I might say, look, you shouldn't do that anymore, but you're not the worst of the worst, and I understand why you're doing it. It's kind of like um, uh, anybody who's been a government employee, you know, you'll talk about postal workers and whatnot. It's like my dad used to say, look, I don't condone people who do that, but I understand it. In any event, that's where I am on this. Um, the guy who was murdered was actively being investigated by what was called the faggot squad and, uh, at the police department, and they had independent evidence. Uh, again, this isn't just the defendant saying, uh, well, he didn't say it in this case because his lawyer didn't let him, but he would have said it if he'd been asked um, that this guy had molested him. But it, it's not just his saying it. The police had evidence of this. This guy was under an active investigation for a series of uh, various sex crimes, uh, molestations, and, and other more serious offenses, I suppose. But in any event, uh, there, was, there was ample evidence to support uh, the proposition that this was retribution for having been uh, molested by this man when he was younger. Now, I don't know what the jury, the second jury would have done. Perhaps the jury would have said, look, uh, we understand, but you're guilty of the top count, and you still should be put to death. We can't, we just can't tolerate this in our state, no matter what the reason is. If it's not a defense against imminent harm, we don't get, we don't make any, we don't grant any excuses. Maybe the jury would have said that, but I don't think the jury would have said that. More importantly than that, the prosecutor didn't believe the jury would have said that. Why else, the why else engage in all this corruption and deception? Because he knows that juries are sympathetic to people who have been raped or sexually molested as children, or any other uh, host of other things by absolutely dreadful people. They don't condone the killing, but they're also not prepared to say that this is the worst of the worst, the most deserving of the state's opprobrium, the most deserving to be executed. So, some time goes by, the guy exhausts, exhausts all of his appeals, and they all say, uh, you should stay convicted, you should stay sentenced to death, and uh, bleh, that kind of thing. And then it goes up to the, the highest court in, in the state of Pennsylvania. Uh, the judges uh, hear it, and the chief judge of that court denies some uh, certificate. Anyway, the long and the short of it is they say, no, you're still convicted, you're still uh, sentenced to death, <clears throat> go away. It goes up to the Supreme Court, and it turns out, and this is, this is another layer of the corruption, that the, the chief judge of the highest court in the state, the chief justice, was the original district attorney 
who signed off on putting this man to death in the first place. He wasn't the one who engaged in the corruption. Uh, he's just the one who signed off saying, yes, this is a person who is deserving of death. He made a decision on the merits of the case, on the facts of the case, that this particular defendant needs to be put to death. If uh, they, can, they can swing it at all, he's deserving of, of the ultimate penalty. He campaigns for election to that court, uh, bragging about all of the men that he, or all of the people, I don't know if any of them were women, I doubt they were, but it could have been, all of the people that he has uh, sent to death row, all of the people who have been put to death because of his efforts as the district attorney, and anybody who thinks that he's going to be elected to a judgeship or be appointed to a judgeship and uh, have a different opinion on the death penalty has another thing coming. So he's very pro-death penalty, not saying that's right or wrong. Uh, whether it is right or wrong in general, it's definitely wrong in this case because he made a decision on the merits when he was the prosecutor, then he becomes the chief judge of the, the, the state court, tries to use that to deny access to this defendant to be able to get a, a fair hearing on the merits and all these other things, and so the guy is still uh, sentenced, to, uh, sentenced to death. But it raises an interesting question because at, on an appellate court, the, the opinion of one judge does not command a majority. Even if you're the chief judge, you still get one vote the same as anyone else. So you have to ask yourself, uh, is the original corruption bad enough? I think that it is. Or can that be offset by the, the unanimous view of all the other judges on the same, uh, same court? And as Justice Kennedy put it in the oral arguments, it's very difficult to ask an appellate court to decide that the opinion of one of their judges is completely irrelevant and that that judge is completely incapable of persuading his colleagues back when they're having their little uh, powwow about what to do in this particular case. But uh, it, it is difficult to want to argue uh, for the, the rights and, and the liberty and the fair trial of a man who bludgeoned uh, and set a, set a man on fire. Uh, I don't know whether he was dead or alive and he was set on fire. It's difficult to want to do that because no matter which way you cut it, this is not acceptable conduct. This is absolutely dreadful stuff. Nevertheless, if you don't take a stand on it, you set a precedent. A little bit of corruption in the system just doesn't hurt it, which is a proposition I can't accept. The, the uh, pro a prosecutor manufacturing evidence, supporting perjury, and then the district attorney making a, a decision on the merits, and then winding up sitting as a judge, uh, overseeing the court, deciding whether or not all the previous uh, corruption really matters, that is outrageous. This, this case, this man must be given a new trial, or at least uh, a new uh, hearing on, on the penalty phase. I think he deserves a new trial outright. Um, and the, one of the reasons I think that is that obviously the prosecutors believe that the jury would not side with them or else they would not have cover up, covered up evidence that they had, they would not have suborned perjury and all of, uh, all of these, these other things. They know that the juries are sympathetic to victims of dreadful crimes when they're younger and though they, I'm going to say it again, though they don't condone the killing and retribution for it, they can understand it. And putting all, all that together, they're not inclined to want to give the prosecutor what it was he was asking for. And uh, I, I think that a, a jury should have a fair chance to hear all of the evidence and actually decide upon the full culpability of this man based on all those facts rather than some uh, contrived narrative that was abetted by an incompetent defense counsel, met the guy for an hour the evening before trial for a capital case, what kind of shit is that, and a corrupt prosecutor's office. Uh, but in any event, uh, when, you, when you talk about that, um, the, the corruption and the fair trial and everything, one of the arguments that comes up in, in appeals all the time is, Think about the societal cost and the interest in finality, the, the societal cost of having a new trial. Fuck the societal cost in having a new trial. Did you ever think that when you have elected offices, bad outcomes are a consequence of those elections? Perhaps if they're getting a lot of bad outcomes in a particular area, that should be an indicator to the electorate that they need to start electing better people. This is just part and parcel of democracy. This is how, how courts abet incompetence in government. It's by trying to, to go behind it and, and let the... Uh, let the decisions of the electorate to put into office people who apparently are corrupt or allow corruption to happen and then say they shouldn't have to suffer the financial repercussions of having to pay for that. No, they should suffer it. You should the, force the electorate to be involved in the elections and force the electorate to really press their public officials and force the electorate uh, to essentially uh, eat their own vomit. If you elect a guy who allows corruption to, to happen or is engaged in corruption or whatever, all, all of the consequences that flow from that are a result of your democratic choices. Don't talk to me about uh, the societal cost. You should think about the societal cost of corrupt officials before you elect them and really vet them and really make sure that they're not corrupt people and they're going to do what they say and all these other various things. 
you need to do it because if you don't, the policy of the courts is you'll just have to do it over and over and over until you get it right. And if that costs every penny in taxes that your, your city gets, then so be it. Do a better job electing people. Be a more involved electorate. All right, that's all I have to say on that. You guys have a great day.